Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's Bear Like a Keynote, the second of uh, the fall semester 2022. Um, it's a pleasure to have Arquitectura G uh, speak tonight, uh, which is a Barcelona-based architectural practice founded in 2006. They work applying the best custom-made solutions in search of a humane architecture. They have a broad experience in renovation of historical architecture, and their current work combines international projects of unique renovations and new constructions. Um, widely published in national and international media, they have won several awards, most notably the Emerging uh, Architect Prize uh, of the European Union Prize for Contemporary Architecture, Mies van der Rohe Award in 2015. In addition to their architectural practice, they are in charge of the architecture section of Apartamento magazine, and they established the, the furniture company Indoors in 2012. It's a pleasure to have A. Tora uh, present on behalf of his partners. Welcome to the Berlage and to Baukunde TU Delft. We look forward to the talk. Thanks. Hello. So thank you for having me here on behalf of Arquitectura G, which is our office in, in Barcelona. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation and for, for coming. Uh, first of all, uh, I just want to explain a bit uh, what I will speak about today. Uh, so it's a lecture divided in two parts, let's say, in two acts. The first one is about uh, like the behind the scenes uh, process of designing in our office. Uh, and, and it's uh, mostly two uh, stores uh, we did for Agnes Studios, which is a Swedish uh, fashion brand. And then the second half of the lecture will go back to an old project we did uh, that shares some features with some new projects uh, we have done recently. So um, in order to, to know a bit more about us, uh, we have to say that uh, we work with models quite a lot. In fact, this is this is um, a photo of our office, our studio, and as you can see, it's uh, completely full of models, one to twenty scale models of uh, everything. And this is like this not because we thought about it as a strategic way that uh, uh, we thought was the best, but it's just a consequence of the the, the way we started to to work together. Um, I was telling uh, Juan before, he was asking me about how uh, we formed the office, how the, the, the team started. And actually we, we met at, at the school, we, we were studying together and we would do class assignments together as a group, then also we would join competitions together for students. And then uh, for the last uh, final uh, thesis year, uh, we we rented a space together, the four of us, and uh, we started to, to 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 work together like physically. And you know, little by little, uh, some friends came, and uh, one person said, "I have an office. What can we do? I don't have the money, but uh, let's do something." And so we started with really tiny, tiny, tiny projects. And in order to have full control of them, we would uh, build one to twenty scale models of them. And so uh, we, we, we did, uh, that, that was back in 2008, which was um, uh, economically speaking a really, really bad year, especially in Spain with the real estate market going down and the construction market uh, completely collapsing. So it was a really bad time for architects to finish our degrees. So we started uh, working on small scale projects that were like a training field uh, for many things we have learned about the, the scale, uh, of human body, attention to detail, uh, domesticity in its broader sense, and so on. And so uh, since then, we, we work with uh, 1 to 20 scale models as a consequence. But also, we have realized that they work very well uh, because, first of all, when you build a model, you have to think how to build it. And by thinking how you build it, you, you are actually thinking 
about how you would build that in reality, which seems pretty uh, obvious. But uh, when you confront the uh, process of, of, of making a model, which I'm sure you have done several times, uh, you already realize that some things don't work. You know, things that you have you had in your mind. So it's like a, a test. Also, it's uh, nice to uh, think about matter by manipulating matter. You can check how light comes in. You can also, we have four partners and, and more people in the team. Uh, these big models are in the middle of the office, so uh, you can t just escape from them. You, you, you see them all the time, so they, they make you part of, of, of the process. And also, uh, for the communication with clients, it's very, very good. Uh, because with, uh, let's say, 3D visuals, you always focus like on one part, but you don't see the part on the whole at the same time, which happens with models. So, well, it works for us. And uh, uh, we will, I will start with the, with the first project. Um, this is in Stockholm, in, in Sweden, and it's uh, in the... Uh, ground floor of uh, an old building from the 1880s. And it's a neoclassical building. And let, do you see the, the, the mouse? Yeah. OK. So this was a courtyard, OK, open air courtyard. And this was the facade of, of the building with an entrance in the corner. And this was like a classic building of, of that era. And then later, in the beginning of the 20th century, they uh, did a major transformation work, and they, they turned th this open air space into a kind of Greek temple with Doric columns and uh, glass roof, and uh, everything around, uh, it's a sort of, uh, let's say, classic Doric temple, uh, or at least it, it has that uh, vocabulary. And this was, this was then, later on, uh, from the 60s on, it was a bank. And um, in the 70s, there was a robbery in that bank. And people came into the bank, took hostages for some days. They would keep the hostages uh, into the vaults. And uh, they, at some point, uh, one of the leaders inside asked for a Ford Mustang to get away. From, from the place, and uh, it's like, it, it was like basically like, you know, in a movie, like give me one million dollars for Mustang so I can leave. And um, so at days went by, then the, the, the police uh, broke in and they, they, they were throwing like uh, gas and um, the, 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 these were the kind of the, 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 the scenes of what happened and actually if the first time we went to the place, there were holes in the ceiling um, where the police would, you know, throw the, the, the gas from. And so the thing is that um, when the police came, the hostages were more scared of the police than uh, of the robbers. Like, they, they, they developed a sort of loyalty to, to, to the criminals. And so this is where the Stockholm Syndrome term was coined, like this very place and this uh, event. And uh, well, this, these are like real pictures of the, of the event. And um, well, it was uh, like a funny coincidence that we had to work on the place that, uh, you know, gave birth to the term Stockholm Syndrome. And so uh, in this, uh, this collaboration, it's very much based in a dialogue with the creative director of the company, uh, Johnny Johansson. So uh, they would they usually come with a brief. Sometimes it's a sentence, sometimes it's a song, sometimes it's like images. And in this case, the, the initial brief was uh, Stockholm Syndrome. And so uh, we had to work in this uh, space. Uh, this space was uh, full of I mean, you, you obviously had the base of this kind of Doric Greek temple, but then over the years, they, they added lots of layers of, of uh, things that were not so great. So the first thing we did was to, to clean that. And then, uh, well, we started to play with these images. 
in a way that uh, you know we isolate those images, we cut it, we trim it with with the scissors, then we scan it, uh, we start playing with them, and for instance, we we you know we just threw it into the model. This is a, a photo of, of of the model, and this would be like a background uh, where the feeding rooms are, and then once um, the literal photography disappears, it becomes just a, just a shape, uh, a shape which is more abstract and that you can start to play with to uh, create sort of screens that hide the access to the fitting rooms, which is, um, well, basically, you know, the stores have th three parts, like the open area, the back of the house where the storage is, and then uh, the fitting rooms, and fitting rooms are like the most complicated one sometimes because you don't want to open a door in front of everyone. So we were playing with this idea of screens. Screens that no longer are nothing related to, to the robbery, but uh, in a way they are. Like here, they, they completely lose their, their original sense. I, I will show you, I mean, all of this was discarded. I mean, we did something completely different, but this is just for you to, to see how Sometimes projects are twisty roads and not clean shots, and this was kind of twisty. So um, here you can see like layers of screens, like uh, here and then in, in the background, like instead of having one big screen, there are different screens, like these ones that then reveal the, the real back of the store. Also, we were trying to, to, you know, how can we make furniture which is related to the Stockholm Syndrome thing, uh, but in an abstract way. Also, we started to, to play with tapestry, like uh, thick tapestry. And these are some tests uh, we did, which, are, which proposed like two separate languages, right? The, the Doric Greek um, one, and this sort of uh, superimposition of uh, wild tapestry in pieces, in colors. All of that was discarded. And then we started uh, playing instead. We, 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 we didn't really, we were not so convinced about this idea of screens and we started focusing on the idea of shell, like the contour. The shell. Um, this is heritage listed, uh, not because the because of the, the way it looks, but because of the robbery. So they want to keep the looks, just because that thing happened, and so we couldn't, you know, paint it or we couldn't do anything. So we started experimenting with wrapping it up, like in a radical way, um, with silver paper, and then. In the background, in the background, uh, we would have this kind of huge mirror that hides the um, feeding rooms, and um, those Im images are or were very, very nice to us. But then we started wrapping it up with paper, just for trying something different related to the shell. Because, but basically, the basics of the project, the final one are already here, which are treat all, treat all the shell as one and then put things, on putting things. That's, that's, that's a bit, uh, let's say, the core of the project. Then here we started to, I don't know how well it looks in that screen. Well, you, you don't see very much, but in my screen looks better. <laughs> um, so it's basically uh, wrapping everything with paper and then uh, coming with this uh, very, very simple um, hangers and uh, rails. Um, as you can see, this is like soldered in, I mean, this is a, a wire and it's, it's, it's done there in the office. So all of those wrapping ideas were discarded because it was, it, it looked a, a bit like temporary, like not permanent and so basically our final decision was to um, focus 
on creating a new set of columns here, like one, two, three, four, which are fake columns. Because if you, hey, okay. If you pay attention to the store, um, the floor is real marble, uh, which is called Ekeberg marble from uh, southern Sweden. But all of the walls and columns are painted uh, marble, are like uh, fake marble. It's, it's a kind of uh, technique called uh, skyola, which uh, mimics the marble, but they are not uh, marble columns. And it's a kind of stucco. So what we did was, was to create a set of four columns, fake columns of real marble. Let's say we started playing with this idea of what is real and what is uh, fake, and, and we, we came with, instead of doing real columns of fake marble, we, we did fake columns of real marble that um, hit all the fitting rooms. And so then we started our collaboration with uh, Max Lamb. Max Lamb, he's an artist from uh, England, and uh, he's been contributing to uh, Agnes Studios from a, a very early era, and uh, he's basically he he's been responsible for many of the furniture pieces of the of, of the office. So uh, we were thinking on having these sort of islands, island-like pieces in the middle of the space. So. You, so that you could work around them and they could uh, organize the space. And then all of the uh, windows would be uh, rails and all of the rest would be just free space. So these are just first tests. Then uh, they told us uh, that it should include some something warmer, such as wood, and we started also experimenting with wood. But the basics were here, like, a, clean uh, envelope and some pieces that organize the space. And after all of that work, we came to the final uh, option, uh, that, uh, uh, which I will show you now. Uh, so, well, uh, back then, all, like this surface and this and this uh, was painted gray, and what we did was to extend this kind of uh, um, stucco-like uh, surface uh, to the rest of the store so that we could have a completely monochrome shell of uh, this marble and stucco. And therefore, it, it, it also made sense that all the pieces in the middle of the store were out of uh, that very marble. So we, we saw where um, the quarry was, and we sent uh, Max Lamb there to the quarry to work directly with his hands with his uh, stone. And he did these pieces, which are the cash desk and other pieces that organize the space. And then our project in the end was just a set of columns and a decision, which is to make everything monochrome. And so in, in the end, the project was just this. It is like a more abstract interpretation of the existing columns which you can see in the background. And so therefore, in a way, they close the, the hall, which is the main hall of the store, but then you can uh, uh, tell that they are not part of a project. So then we also treated the floor. Uh, we Some parts of the floor were original and nice looking, but some others uh, were new and it looked like tiles, so we also opened, uh, you know, we broke all the, the joints be, be between the floors, and this is the final um, drawing of the store, which is these huge slabs of stone and this set of columns. And this is the final model, which is this. This is like the main hall with a set of columns on this piece. And this one here is Max saying hi. And uh, this is Neckerberg in, in the quarry. So uh, we would pick uh, the boulders of rock and then they were sliced uh, in different sizes depending on their function. And then from there on, it, it was uh, manual labor. This is, uh, this is actually the cash desk. 
well, you can see the size of a hammer. Then these pieces, which are the, the legs of, of, of the other pieces, were, um, we, we, we drilled this, we extracted these cylinders from them because they were simply too heavy. And then those cylinders became the tools of the feeder rooms. Then we started the collaboration with Benoit Lalos, which is a light designer from Paris. And he came with this idea of having a very big ceiling of light. He, he works always with a very sharp, um, let's say fu futuristic, maybe not, that's not the most appropriate word, um, kind of light. I mean, he's, he's, he doesn't design objects, he designs, let's say, light. And every contribution of his is not picking a product, but creating a source of light. And we, in, we tried this, this in the model, and we thought it was too heavy, and that we were losing this idea of continuous shell. So uh, this was uh, later on modified uh, towards this. All these renderings are from uh, Benoit's office. And this is the layout of, of, of the lighting, which is uh, kind of nice superimposition between two languages colliding. And therefore, we went from this model to this in reality. And here, well, here you can like really see the size of the pieces and uh, this game of textures, fake textures that go around the whole thing. This is the colonnade, the new set of columns I was referring to, which is basically the only thing we did in the store. And then the funny thing is that um, the, in, the, in the brand, they liked that much this collaboration based on models that they launched a capsule collection for the opening of the store. And they sent us a miniature pieces of the, the clothes that uh, would be part of a of a capsule collection, and they told us to take pictures of them in the in, inside the, the model for the promotion of, of this capsule collection, which is kind of nice. Then let's go to Japan, and this will be the second of the projects with Agnes Studios. Well, so <clears throat> this starts with a very Japanese situation, meaning it is a store which is not in the ground floor, um, but on the first floor. Uh, well, uh, maybe you know Japan, and if, if you do, you know that sometimes not all stores are in the ground floor, accessible directly from the street, but that they are sometimes at the seventh floor of a random building, and if you don't know, you don't know. In this case, uh, it was it was in the in the first floor, and so the length of well, the space was the full length of this window. All of this became a store, and uh, we also had to play with this. They requested from us uh, something that would be recognizable uh, from from the street, from the street level. This was the space as we found it. It was, um, well, pretty neutral, let's say, but it had a window that was like 20 something meters long, which is uh, quite a thing. And the, the, main, the main bad thing about this space is that the ceiling was really low. It was like uh, under the beams, it was like 220 or something like that, uh, which is not ideal. And this is the space that it was. In the beginning, the ideas they, they had in mind were to you know, cut the space here. So this was like the back of house and all of this was the open area. But from the beginning, our strategy was more like giving the whole window area to the store and, and concentrating here the parts that are not accessible to public. Uh, one of the features that, the, because this space was pretty anonymous, like not, it didn't have like any remarkable feature besides the long window and the columns. So we started to play with 
these columns, the idea of these columns becoming something else, something that could become part of the personality of the store. And then uh, from the beginning, we had a, a division here, so we had a clear open area towards the street. And then model pictures. It's like, you know, in, in our office, when we are developing an idea that we think might work, uh, there is a moment where someone says, like, let's try it in the model. And if, I mean, when you try it in the model, it's like you have some sort of hope uh, about that idea to becoming something interesting. Uh, then different ideas. This is like, I know it's like lots of information, but it's like information we normally don't show. And, um, but as we are at an architecture school, maybe you find it interesting to see what happens behind the scenes. Uh, all right, so then here we, try, we started to try what happens if these partitions don't touch the ceiling and are lower, so everything becomes deeper. Also trying with different materials. And the truth is that the, the brief we got for this one was high-tech, low-tech, which is a very Japanese thing, if you ask me where, you know, you, you, Japan is like that country where trains uh, work perfectly, everything is so safe and works perfectly, but at the same time, everything is so messy and chaotic and, you know, streets are full of wires and, and, and full of, you know, uh, things. <laughs> and so this kind of idea of uh, high-tech, low-tech was something that uh, we wanted to implement in the store, but we still didn't really know how to. Uh, then the idea of divisions, when because we had this idea of division, how do you divide this, this space uh, in a way that is Japanese? Uh, it's not because you have to do it in a Japanese way per se, it's because uh, one of the features of this brand is that they don't want to have just one style of stores repeated through, throughout the world, but they want uh, to adapt to it you know, the local um, uh, situations, so every store is different. Uh, so we were thinking of, about these thin panels as dividers, like these screens or these sliding doors, and uh, we started playing with paper. Also back then, uh, stainless steel was a big part of the uh, Agnes Studios DNA. They, would, uh, they, they, they were using it uh, extensively in their stores. So we were trying models with paper, but thinking about stainless steel, which is strong enough to be slender and to, you know, feel like a paper. Different tests inside. And this is pretty similar to a final version of it. So it's, you access the store through a escalator this is the street level, and you come up, and then here you come into the store, and the store has, as I said before, this open space for customers. All of this would be storage area, and then VIP fitting room, and two extra fitting rooms here be behind the, the, these panels. So it's a bit like three, a gesture of three curves, like one, two, three, and that's basically the project. Uh, so then we started with, you know, doing these 10 models, trying with different colors, changing the shape of the, of the columns, trying inside how this would look like. Then the models start to tell you like that the reflection of the light coming in is also a thing that uh, becomes a feature of a store. And we started also uh, this dialogue with the light designer, which is uh, Benoit Lalos, as I, uh, as I told in the other store. And as the ceiling was so, so low, it had to be something really flat. But it was very important because uh, um, as it was in the, on the first floor, from the street level, in a way the ceiling was our facade because it's the thing you, you see the most. So he came with this uh, grid of pieces that would be seen from the street like an army of lights here in the, in the ceiling. 
And then we translated that into the model, which is basically punching holes and putting a light on top. Different colors, different variations. And one day, we grabbed the scissors and we started to trim the tops of uh, this uh, thin uh, tin foil. And suddenly it was somehow more interesting because, uh, you know, it, the space becomes deeper in a way. Also, uh, we left these uh, rails like that, not perfect, which is a, a bit cliche, but, you know, this Japanese beauty of uh, the imperfection. And this was more the final project for us. And then we went to Japan. And to our surprise, the ceiling was gone. There was no ceiling anymore. So, uh, okay, what do we do now? And they also wanted to save costs, if possible. So we made this, uh, uh, this is a, a, a collage of fo photos uh, looking uh, towards the ceiling. Like we put the phone, we did like a grid on the floor and we put the phone taking photos of, of the ceiling and we did this sort of map to see how it was overlapping all these machines because suddenly it was maybe interesting to keep all of that intact and to see how this worked with you know our panels and our layout. And we did this sort of um, work of uh, looking for wires and looking for mains and looking for, in fact, this high-tech, low-tech that we uh, didn't expect that much, but that we embraced fully. And uh, as we were there in Japan, we did this collage, which is a real photo with uh, a model, a piece of a model on top, and we sent it to the creative director, and he loved it. And um, so we said, okay, so let's, let's do it like that. And then the lights became a suspended army of spaceships that were hanging from, from a rod. Then we also played the, the floor. We, you know, here there is this clash between the sharp, sharpness, lightness, precision, and also this rough uh, environment. And uh, as for the floor, uh, we worked with a carpet company called Castal, and we, um, we developed a, a, a carpet that would vary in, in height, so it was two centimeters thick here, but then it, the pile grew up to eight centi centimeters here. And here we had, this is not, not the final uh, thing, but uh, we, we, you'll, you'll see later on. We had this sort of islands of really, really long hair uh, carpet. And so from this, what we did was to, in order to keep the human touch of this, we took th those pieces from the model, we put them uh, on the scanner, and then we, uh, with the AutoCAD, we drew, o o you know, on top of a, of a scanned image, and we did the same with, with this, Then we did like a 3D model of what we had in the model, and um, this was sent directly to production. This is the final drawing of a, of a ceiling with all of the wires and uh, uh, superimposed to, to the floor plan. Actually, this is, uh, like a final drawing, and then, um, well, working working with Japan can be challenging. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it, it, there is certainly a cultural gap in some some things. I'm not saying it's worse or better, but it's just sometimes uh, it requires a dialogue, and uh, it's like when when they because we in the end we just did these three curved stainless steel panels, right? It's not that much. But uh, the construction companies, they went, when they want to say no to something, at least in our case, they came with like a ridiculous price, you know? It's like, okay, this panel is cost like 800,000 euros or something like that. And it was like, no way they cost that, you know? And it's, it, it's just because it was the Olympics. The, they thought the Olympics were coming 
then they didn't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everything was sort of uh, crazy. And so we had to produce these panels locally in Barcelona and ship them to, to Japan, which is pretty absurd, but that's the way it went. Uh, here you can see like the thinness of, of, of it. And here they are ready for shipping. And once they arrived, also the curved shape is very helpful for earthquakes because you have sometimes, you know, this horizontal movement and uh, they can keep uh, their thinness while still being resistant. And uh, so, yeah, this is the model and this is reality. Again, model and reality. Here you can see how, um, in this case, the final shape is a direct and pretty literal translation of, of the model itself. Uh, because even the mistakes of the model are here part of the store. And so this is like the main area. This is a long hair island for sitting and displaying product. Also look at the thinness of the shelves. Everything was sharp in contrast to the environment. All the doors were nothing but just a big plane what was, that was pivoting here. And this is from outside. Now, now I will take my jacket off. <laughs> Okay, so this project is from 2012, 13, something like that. Uh, it was our biggest project back then, and uh, we learned quite a lot from here. And I think there are some features of this project that uh, have somehow resurrected later on, years after, uh, that are also now somehow present in our ar architecture. So basically, this is uh, where the house is. It's a town called, uh, a tiny village called uh, Cilleros, in close to the border with Portugal. And uh, we have our office here in Barcelona. And well, when you start to, to work internationally, you, you, you understand that in reality, distances are not measured in kilometers, but they are measured uh, it's about the closest airport you have a direct flight to, no? Because it might be, uh, it's, what I'm saying, it, it was much easier to come to Delft than coming to Cilleros just because the flight, you know, um, works better. Uh, so every time we went, we had to either uh, take the high-speed train or um, uh, the, the, the plane to Madrid, then another train uh, here, then a smaller train here, then a bus here, and then somebody had to go to pick you up because there wasn't more, op uh, there weren't more options. Um, and so this was something that from the very beginning would make things more difficult. And it was part of also of the conception of the, of the project in terms of uh, materials. So this is a village. This, this, this area is a very, very, very nice looking area. Uh, mountains, uh, rolling hills, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic, but uh, it's, uh, people are uh, moving, especially, you know, all the young people are moving to bigger towns, they are moving to cities, and uh, all the houses are pretty abandoned. So there is this um, foundation that buys property, and they sell them super cheap, super, super cheap on one condition. You have to completely refurbish it and take care of it because uh, otherwise, you know, towns are, villages are here literally collapsing. So um, in this case, our client bought two houses. This is uh, Casa Luz. I mean, her name is Luz. 
and this is Casa Gabriela. It was for her daughter, but this was never, uh, or it's not for now, uh, real. It's not a project. And so from the very beginning, we 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 had well, this, this would be Casa Gabriela, and this would be Casa Luz. Casa Luz is very narrow and deep, and from the beginning, we came with this idea of of uh, creating an empty space inside. This is Casa Gabriela, which didn't happen. And these are the landscape you you see. You can hear approaching this area. You can drive, you know, for some minutes without crossing with any other car, and it's truly wonderful. So once here, the only thing to be kept was this is the main facade, and this is the back facade. Everything inside was completely uh, rotten like all the timber structure and everything. Then the party walls were rammed earth party walls. It's the first time uh, that we worked with that material, that it's basically pressed um, soil. And I don't know how well you see the shape of the house, but there is something here. If, if, you, if you, do you see these lines? Well, kind of. So. All the divisions are like linear, you know, these plots which are like rectangles, but here we, we see a sort of exception here. Like our, our plot, which, which is this, had this irregular shape here in the back. And uh, this is because at some point, uh, people living in this house uh, sold or gave or exchanged this part of their house to the uh, owners of this, but they kept a window here but they lost their garden, so all the garden becomes uh, part of this. Actually, this house was bought for uh, by the owner because she really wanted to have a house with a garden. And so these are the first sketches um, with the staircase in, like, in a kind of awkward position. These are tiny scale models, but uh, the idea was from the uh, beginning uh, to divide it in, in, into halves. And as I mentioned, the distance as a key factor before, we were thinking about uh, you know, these CLT cross-laminated timber panels that are um, cut with CNC machines, and then they are sent and installed really fast. Uh, we thought that was a very good solution because we needed some sort of technological material that could be built in a fast way because we couldn't you know, simply be there like all the time. So we started with this idea of, of a wood timber structure house, which is this. And then at a certain point, and also when we had the first uh, quotations, uh, we realized that it wasn't even cheaper than doing it using just local labor, local materials, and local uh, knowledge. Because shipping those trucks from uh, Austria, in this case, all the way up, to, to this uh, tiny village was kind of, you know, something that didn't really make sense. So we, we translated the same shape into a more, um, well, a well-known technique for uh, the, the workers uh, in, in the village. So it's, it's basically, you will see it there in the pictures, but it's steel structure. And in between the beams of the structure, there are these kind of flat bricks and on top of those flat bricks, we pour the concrete and we have a slab of just uh, 10 centimeters, which is pretty thin. So in this case, this is the section. Uh, then we, w once the demolition was completed, we, saw, we found out that uh, the windows in the main facade and the ones in the back facade were not even in, at the same height. So uh, this courtyard or this small patio would absorb those differences by creating um, an exterior uh, walkway to clean the, the to, to wash the, um, the glass that would also become a bench here in, in this side. So, but the strategy is very clear. Like um, the open fr uh, ground floor area is an, like an open air space in which you can uh, stay fresh during the summer but also it's a place where you can just leave your bicycle. It's like an openness, open air space. Uh, and th this project had a very 
it was very constrained economically, so the less things we did, the better. So in, in this, like, it felt natural not to do anything here, but also it was good, economically speaking. Then this side is kitchen and living room, and this side, uh, ba bathrooms and uh, bedrooms uh, looking towards the street. Well, this is the same in an axon. But then going back to this part of, of this irregular shape I mentioned before, this is where we finally put the staircase because it was a nice way to cross, like the, let's say, the public and more public program without disturbing the interior shape and keeping the, the rectangle clean. So this, thanks to this deal they did, like, I don't know how many years ago, we had a nice opportunity for a staircase. To, and then the construction started, and these these are two brothers, like a very small company that the the next town uh, with very basic uh, materials. And this is during the demolition. So the way things were here, in like you couldn't really plan things because we didn't even have like a proper measurement of interior. So instead of going, let's say, once a week or every 10 days to a site visit, uh, we went just once a month, but instead of being there for just one day, we would be there for the whole week or maybe five days. So we would you know, wake up with them, draw the details on site with them, and leave them with uh, work for 15 days in drawings, you know, hand drawings, because also these drawings were you know, easy for them to understand, but sometimes like floor, you know, uh, uh, sections and, and, and uh, uh, well, like elevations uh, and that stuff, for these details, it didn't work very well with them, so we, we did these sort of actions by, by hand, and uh, this was a bit like the, the process. And these are some of the final uh, photos of the, of, the, of, of the work. So. Uh, there is there is a tree in the middle, and uh, well, one one funny thing about about this is that, well, to start with, the, you, you see that this this door it was like in between two levels, and it has like these big steps of stone. We didn't know what this was for, but people in the t in the town would um, tell us that this was just uh, in order to jump on a donkey. Uh, you know, you would come here so you can climb on, on the donkey. And, well, we, we didn't know that, but now we all do. <laughs> and so, uh, as I mentioned, this, this is a fully open uh, space. So that means there is no glass behind this. And this, this, this is called uh, Calle de la Iglesia, which means uh, Church Street, which is, of course, the street that leads to church. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, in, in this area, there, there are you know, lots of elder, elder, elderly people, and therefore people die, and uh, you know, these people would you know, go to a funeral like pretty often, and every time from inside you could hear their thoughts on the, on the words. Like, you know, I've, I've heard that they want to, to put a tree inside. I mean, they are out of their minds, like, uh, or you know, was it so weird? What are they doing? This, you know, uh, because but it was it was it was very fun because when you come to the house, it's like people behind the window, like looking at you, like what are you doing in my village? Um, but so therefore, this became the house of the tree for the people in town, uh, and then. Uh, this, this, this house was awarded with uh, the Mies van der Rohe Award in 2015, and then it, 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 you know, it went kind of, well, it was on, on several websites, and then now the people in the village call it the house of the internet. So this, uh, this is the interior. As you can see, it's pure economy of means. Uh, these terracotta tiles and terracotta ceilings with its natural color. Uh, that give this warmth uh, in a natural way without anything else to add. Uh, all the rest was like, you know, very handmade and, and, and very simple, but relying a lot on the uh, craftsmanship of, of the people involved. Everything is 
always related to two exteriors, either the garden or the street and the patio. So there is always this kind of breeze situation in the summer. And uh, also the, uh, the tree helps to, to control the, the sun uh, in, in the summer. Then in the winter, the tree loses its leaves and the sun can come in and uh, we have this uh, greenhouse effect which helps with the um, well uh, climatization. As you can see, like everything is very raw, like just you know IKEA uh, pieces put there. Also, window frames were very cheap, but there are some other thoughts uh, involving this economy of means that we think are still valid. Like you know, these these days, um, <clears throat> everything has to be like it's like comfort has become like the new religion in a way. Like everything has to comply with certain regulations which make sense sometimes and it doesn't uh, s some other times. Because even because you, you want to have everything perfectly insulated so that you, know, you don't use energy and therefore the carbon footprint of, of that is not big. But sometimes like this house that is you know, she goes there maybe four times a year. Uh, I, I wonder what's bigger, if the carbon footprint of the, you know, perfect insulation of this, or, you know, just lighting up a, a fire uh, every time she, she goes there on winter. Like, sometimes the most sustainable thing to do is wearing a jacket, you know. And I think this, this the standard that you could apply to your permanent house and the one that you can apply to a second home or to a holiday home doesn't have to be the same because it simply doesn't make sense to add, let's say, fat to the thickness of, of things just for the sake of uh, regulations that don't take into consideration when this makes sense and when it doesn't. So also it has to do with uh, here with a bit, the, the, um, as you can see, the toilets are uh, well, the, the, the bathroom, the toilet itself is not exposed, but the bathroom is exposed to this open area. And this reminds us, uh, and this is something we have kept, I mean, we kept doing um, every time we can. Um, it has to do with, uh, com uh, we, we collaborate with uh, Apartamento magazine. Uh, we write the architecture section of, of the magazine, and uh, we had this conversation with um, Cesar Manrique. Well, not with him, because he passed away, but uh, one of the representatives of a foundation uh, that knew him very well. And he was, uh, he, like, we, one, one of the, if you ever go to Lanzarote in Canary, Canary Islands, you must visit uh, Cesar Manrique's houses and, and work because it's truly brilliant. And uh, one thing that catches your eye in his houses are the bathrooms. Uh, to start with, they are super big. They are very big and they have super big windows and they are, you know, they have this strong connection with the exterior. Uh, and sometimes, especially, let's say, uh, in contemporary architecture, toilets are like, you know, just the last uh, corner of a house where you close a door and uh, they are defined by a circle in the floor and not by any other thing related to your daily activity. And it's like uh, he said, Toilet is the first place you go to when you wake up. And it's the last place you go to before going to bed. And at the end of the year, you spend like many hours there having a shower, washing your teeth, uh, whatever. And uh, why, why, why should this be you know, less pleasant than a bedroom? Because in the bedroom, at the end of the day, you just sleep. And so this hierarchy of uh, bathrooms being like worse than other pieces, uh, well, was, you know, something that we, we, we put in our backpack for the future projects. And, and this here, for instance, the client said, like, you know, it's such a pleasure to wash my teeth looking at the stars, you know. Okay. And then two more recent projects. Uh, this is a housing block in Barcelona. It's 
uh, two duplexes and four apartments. And um, the complexity of this project comes from the plot itself. Usually, these kind of buildings in Barcelona and many other places have like a front facade and then a back facade. And between the back facade and the next building, there is some space. So you can also open windows in the back facade, right? So you have typically rooms in one end and in the other end. And in the middle, you have like kitchen and bathrooms and maybe some small uh, courtyard for ventilation. And that's like the typical scheme. But here, this uh, wasn't really easy to do because uh, the, the building behind was very, uh, was right in the in the edge of the of the limit of the plot. So if we did that, we just had three meters here, and the, also the plot was too deep. So uh, it was very difficult to handle all the situation in the middle. So it was for sale for some time, and um, a developer that we started to work with many years uh, before when he bought like a tiny apartment. Um, well, trusted our office to, to, to do this. Uh, and the main principle of this building is pretty easy to, to, to tell. Uh, instead of doing one facade here and another one in the back, we would just do one facade that then bends itself towards the interior, creating a courtyard that it's not like an interior courtyard, or, but a courtyard with this urban character, so that uh, if you are here, Either if you are here or inside the courtyard, you have the feeling that the thing at the other side is public space. These are just first approaches. This would be the uh, vertical core of a building. And we were looking for this idea of transparency. Of, um, it, it was an opportunity for the apartments to have much more window, much more light than the typically uh, you know, that's the typical situation of front facade, back facade. So this is one to 20 scale model and this is this is the section. Um, so th this is where the staircase is. This is the elevator. And here uh, there was a swimming pool uh, for everyone that wasn't um, executed, sadly, but uh, it was part of the original project. So then in each side you have the duplex units one apartment, another apartment. This would be the, the section of a duplex and the two units. They are, well, you will see in the layout, but they are basically pretty straightforward. So this would be an interior view of the street, but the rhythm of the windows in the main facade and in the patio is the same, so you don't, from inside, really feel the, different, the, the difference that much although we had to take some windows out because in the beginning it was a perfect grid, but then, uh, well, you know, if you put half the windows, you pay half the price. So uh, we had to adapt the project to its economical uh, reality and take some of the windows out. And so we did it in a way that um, we would avoid the direct, uh, you know, crossed, uh, visions between the units. In this case, this is the ground floor. Uh, the ground, in the ground floor, this uh, courtyard be becomes part of the units of the, uh, of the ground floor. So we have uh, this piece in the middle around which everything is distributed. So this is just one open area with a circular, well, spiral staircase that uh, leads you to the first floor. And then in the back, this could be potentially, this is, you know, for the real estate, all the beds and everything that are drawn here are more for the market that from, but that for reality, because actually this could be an office or uh, any other thing. And then the top floor, this is, these are the two duplex units with this, the rooms and another space here from which you directly see the street through the windows. Then these are like the, this is the typical floor plan for the rest of the um, units. So basically everything revolves around this central uh, block, and then there are two let's say boxes of toilets. This one 
the same as in the ground floor, uh, which makes this space narrower and defines one open space and another one open space. And here, all this space, uh, this would be the main facade, all this space can either be two separate rooms with very big sliding panels, or it can also be a living room, or it can also change over time, because if, I mean, in the beginning you can have a living room here, you can work here, you can have a bedroom here, the other way around, or if later on, uh, you know, you have a family, then you adapt everything to uh, the future situations. And this, this is the main facade. So, um, as you see, as you will see, this bends inwards in, in the, well, in the front elevation, this is more um, obvious. And here you can see the balconies. Uh, everything here is very, it's built with mass, let's say. But the balconies are, and all the metallic features are very, very thin. It's like they don't want to be part of that structure, but they want to become something thin, separated, and slender. And there is, there is even a little gap between this and this. And so well, we were here again looking for that thinness uh, that you can see in the photos. And this is the, 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 the access point to, to the building. So this is the lower, uh, the, well, this is the ground floor on this open courtyard. And the, the houses here can use it for, you know, having lunch or whatever. And this is like the spirit a bit of, 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 a, of a courtyard. Um, you have the presence of Sorry, this tree, which happens to be the same uh, we used in in the house in Extremadura, um, they have this kind of green gray leaves that are, you know tremble, and also living next to a tree um, makes you feel somehow more aware of a changing of a seasons of a year. It 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 gives you this you know, consciousness about you know the passing of time and. Also, a changing landscape from your window. You know, you you if you it's trees are not static. You know, and this one especially, the leaves move in a very very nice way. This would be this would be this central um, yeah core around which you can walk. But again, you know, the amount of windows you have uh, per unit is much more than in other configurations. This is a bit the spirit of the, well, that's like the landscape from inside. Okay, and this one will be the last project for today. And just let me drink a bit of water. Okay, so this is in Barcelona as well. It's this house, probably the ugliest one in the street. This one. So it had this garage, and then from here we had a, a ground floor and a first floor. And the idea of the clients was to renovate this house, to transform it into something uh, better which is ultimately the goal of architects, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and then, so, uh, there was this kind of uh, patio with a porch, with this kind of Ibiza-looking, you know, planters and this, well, special aesthetics. And uh, leaving the aesthetics aside, the truth is, this is, this was facing south, and having this kind of porch here, even if it was ugly, it was kind of the, kind of the right thing to do because you, you really felt like well there. So um, we went there, we were looking at the structure, we were uh, doing some pits to see how the foundations were, etc. And this is a collage of uh, what you see in, in that uh, patio. So this was the you know current condition. So you have 
well, not current anymore, but you know the, the first um, condition. So in the ground floor, you had this garage, the staircase, and then this L was this kind of porch. South is here, or north is here. And in the top floor, you come here, and you have two rooms open to the main uh, facade, and then kitchen, dining, living, and another room. And so the first thing we did, because I didn't mention there was a terrace here, the first th decision we took was to remove that terrace so that we could, we could have a bigger open space and also to uh, make all windows equal, like that. It's just the house it was, but reduced to its you know, most basic form, which is basically the structure, like to take everything out except the columns. So we had this layout, which re somehow respects the layout that was there before, with this open courtyard, big living room, no garage, big kitchen and dining closely related to the exterior area, and then the staircase that went upstairs. And this was very, you know, all these weird diagonal lines and everything was just because it was like that before. And so main room, study, another room, another room or study, but then well, and these are some model pictures of the project. But then something happened, and that something is that uh, during, and I mean, we had everything almost ready to go, but during the inspection phase, we saw that some of the uh, prefab uh, concrete beams were, had a, like a dark color, and uh, in fact, there is a kind of, well, it's not a disease, but it's a condition of materials called uh, aluminosis, which is uh, typical from some beams in, in Southern Europe in, in, in the, between the 50s, 50s and the 70s. The thing is that uh, in the factories, they, they, they discovered that adding aluminum oxide to the concrete made the concrete harden much faster, so they could produce much more concrete. So uh, some factories uh, were adding that uh, uh, product to, to the concrete for many, many years. And like 20 years later, they found out that under certain conditions like humidity or uh, heat, this uh, makes the concrete change its molecular structure and then it collapses. So uh, like bad news, we had aluminosis. Um, I mean, having that material doesn't mean it, it will develop the, the thing, but it means it could do it. So we, we had one notion which was um, reinforcing all the structure and keeping on with, with a plan or plan B, demolition. And it was plan B. So uh, the house was fully demolished, and we started working on a new project that is, I think, very clear in this image. This image is taken looking from the south, let's say. So this is the party wall of a neighbor. The neighbor would be here, and this is the house. Um, so this model represents, I think, the spirit of the house, which is one open air space, and then some, let's say, shelves. Like, it's like, the ho this house is basically three slabs and one column and one staircase and nothing else. Because the spirit of the, of, of the project was to create a porch, a uh, in, inhabitable porch, a house that could be, you know, an open air interior. Like the, the, the whole house was intended to be a porch in a way. So, well, and then, so as the house is so much inwards looking, the main facade had to become just one more wall 
it was just perimeter. So, uh, you know, the amount of expression in the facade is very, very limited. It's just one more wall. This is the section, so it's just the proportion between, sorry, the proportion between open air and interior spaces is almost the same. And you can see here, this is this is the ground floor level. It's an open plan with a, uh, but there are three steps here. So this is at a higher level than this. This is where, where the parking was. So you come in and you are here in a very direct, uh, close relationship to, to the exterior. And the same happens in the first floor, which uh, becomes also a sort of open plan with one, two, three spaces that can be occupied in different forms. You can also potentially build a wall here so you can have a kind of master bedroom, if you want to call it that way. And then the terrace on top with a kitchen for barbecues and parties. So this is it. It's pretty similar to a model, meaning it's just the slabs, um, the column, and the staircase. But then also to protect uh, from the southern sun, we had to do something because uh, things can get pretty hot in summer in Barcelona. So uh, we, we had this system of uh, exterior curtains that can be moved around. So in the winter time, if you want to save some um, energy uh, for heating, you just you know open the curtains. And in, in summer, you just uh, uh, close them. But it allows uh, situations like this, which are maybe if it's a sunny day, you have the curtains, but the, the 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 windows can be open, so you have you know the breeze coming in. This is the facade. So these are like you know shutters. This is fixed, and these two can be moved. This is for uh, having some light inside, but also for you know to in order to protect uh, the people coming in from the rain. And these are the interior pictures where. There is this balance between, you know, are we, is this interior or exterior? Um, it's, it's a porch. Here, when you put all the windows in the back, you can have, you know, just curtains. This would be the kitchen, the end of a, of a floor plan. And this is the top floor. And uh, that's that's all. So yeah, thank you very much for staying. Thank you very much. I believe there are some questions from the audience. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, um, I would like a question about the colors. Um, for me, it's quite remarkable that throughout your work, uh, you use only one or two colors. Um, and it, for, I believe it emphasizes a bit the form uh, of, of the building, but also the gradients and textures within one color specific. And, and so my question is, could you elab elaborate a bit more on why you keep so persistent with the colors and what, if there is like a conviction behind it also? Thank you. So, I mean, we, like many years ago, I think we were still at the architecture school, we had this kind of r rule of the three materials. Like, you cannot put more than three things together. Like, it was, I don't know where did, where did we take that from, but uh, it was like, Okay, so if you have concrete and you have metal, then you have just one option left, but you cannot come with a fourth one. Obviously, this is not like a religion, you know, but uh, it's something that we have done from the beginning. And, and I think it, it's, it, it has also, uh, it, it's also related to the models because sometimes we, the models themselves, when you just have one cardboard, you know, you, 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 you make it with one material and then it's, it's brown and just brown, or it's just one color, and then this idea grows in your mind, and it's difficult for you to see it another way. But 
I mean, and those two things of the limit of three materials and, and the process of the models are true, but also is, it is true that uh, we find peace in this kind of not fully, go, not going fully monochrome, but uh, you know, using just a few uh, colors. So it's the three things together. Thank you. Hello. Um, you mentioned you're in charge of the Apartamento architecture section. How does that type of work influence your architecture work? That's, I think, a very good question. Uh, because it's absolutely true. It, it's very, very, very alive in a way. Or what we do is many times a consequence of those uh, uh, conversations we have for Apartamento Magazine. Usually when people finish their degrees, they start working for someone else. And, uh, you know, they find, they find out their preferences and then they move. And sometimes, you know, there are these, uh, let's say, schools after the school. You know, it's like you, you subscribe to, uh, you know, there are trends within architecture. And it's like, no, no, I'm into this or I'm into that. And then you follow that. And uh, you have a school after the school, let's say. We didn't have that. We, I mean, we never worked for anyone else, which is, uh, I'm not saying that's good or bad, it's just the way things happened. And uh, Apartamento, we, we have been collaborating since 15 years ago now, 15 years already. And so every six months, uh, you know, we have a conversation we, with someone we admire, basically. And it's our opportunity to open a window to another world to knowing better our processes of thinking, to hear thoughts, to hear, you know, what other people have to say, to listen to the masters sometimes. Some, I mean, uh, uh, there is like a variety in the profiles of the people we talk to. I mean, sometimes it's Alvaro Sisa, sometimes it's someone my age, you know, it's, you know, it's a bit. But both of them, you know, tell things that are interesting to us. And subconsciously, Many, many, many things we have learned uh, in the conversations are applied into, into this, I'm sure. Maybe not in a literal way, like, you know, copying, uh, I don't know, the shape or, you know, the way how things are executed. But the driving force behind those decisions is somehow within us. So it's like we are sucking all that information and throughout other people's voices, we find our own voice. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, nice to meet you, Thomas. Um, two questions. First one was, how happy were you secretly about finding the concrete cancer? <laughs> maybe you were happy or maybe you were actually not happy. And second of all, after then taking a decision to start from scratch, of course, this has a huge financial implication for the client and also for you as an architect. How did this, did this influence the way you designed this completely new apartment and your material choice uh, or any of these other things? And how was this in the, for the relationship also? Well, I mean, when we found out this, it was a sort of, you know, disaster because we we even had you know the, the budget from the construction companies. It's like the, we were about to start. If you ask me, what do you? I mean, what have you preferred, this house or the renovation? I would obviously say this one. Uh, but I'm happy to say that the final choice was made by the client, and I think it was a good choice. Uh, but, you know, you have this kind of uh, interior contradictions because on the one hand, you prefer to do something new uh, because at that time we were, I mean, we have done like, I don't know, maybe 60 renovations. We were a bit, you know, <laughs> let's move on. 
but it was it was a mess. It was a mess. Like fin financially speaking, it was something. And so in the end, everyone's happy. Like you know, two years later, everyone is is happy about it, and everyone thinks those were the right decisions to to make. Uh, but in but you know, when this appeared, it was it was not good. No good. And I, I, the, the second part of the question, if I, if I got it right, it's how the previous project influenced this. Is yeah, and like the fact that suddenly, of course, this is way more expensive and all these extra charges come building something completely new. Like how with the client, did you like, how did that impact? In a bad way, you know. I mean, if you have to pay more, you have a problem. So uh, this, pushed us also to be very minimal, not in terms of style, but in terms of, you know, choices, like, uh, you know, very simple, like a few things, just let's, let's be like some, let, let's curate some decisions and with that we build the house. Um, then obviously having these windows is not as cheap as having small windows, but in a way, this project is the renovation project, but taken to the extreme. Like, you know, like, it's, it's in a way, I, an idea built without many changes, you know. It's like, let's, let's make a porch. Yeah, let's do a porch. And we did a porch, you know. And every, in, the, in the end, everyone was convinced about that. And, but yeah, I mean, these things happen, uh, you know, if... I'm sure some of you have built things and, you know, this is not science. Things happen along the way and this was one of them. Thank you. Hello. Um, thanks a lot. Maybe to this last project, you talked a lot about uh, the model you used to develop the ideas. And uh, the model you showed of this showed a wooden structure. So I'm wondering, is this something that happened in the process or abstraction? Very, very good question as well. As well. We did this uh, model, this one. This one, we did it like one year after the project was finished because there was like a prize and we had to submit a model and we did this. And the reason I put it is because it's very useful to explain the concept. But we have, I mean, we have never done a model this, you know, uh, tidy. I mean, we, we use our models and then we, to, to, I mean, we butcher our models with the knife and then we redo it. And then we, I mean, sometimes we have to almost completely redo them before the client comes because, you know, um, we don't treat them as final objects, but as tools. And this one is not that. This one is something built one year later of, of the finishing of a project. And um, I, I actually, you know, <laughs> uh, the good thing about the, the models being weak sometimes is that they allow chance or accident play role, you know, sometimes, I, I, uh, something falls and eh, it's better that way. You know, this is something that would never have happened uh, with uh, I don't know 3D software or whatever. I mean, I'm not against 3D, obviously. It's it's just another way of working. But yes, this model here I didn't show the process. Uh, uh, th this is something else, clearly. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, there is a delay, by the way. So uh, I was very much interested in the decision-making process. Like at the beginning, you were showing us several options, let's say. I can imagine that it came from the client and from the discussion that you were having, I mean, the things. But in general, do you prefer to have a linear process, like pick one option and go straight away and let's say post-produce this, you know, improve it on the way? Or do you prefer the 
usually work with several scenarios, several, let's say, options, and then somehow you pick one. Um, I mean, sometimes it, it happens, I th I'm, I'm sure it happens to you as well. There's like a, sometimes a circle of decisions. I mean, every project is obviously different, but sometimes it's like you, you try one idea, it kind of works, let's try something else, let's try something else, let's try something else, oh my God, it's like I have to deliver this, what do I do? And then suddenly you go back to the first idea and you realize that was the good one. Uh, and, but sometimes you have to walk away from it so that you realize it was good. So it's like, it, it must be a very, very, very good idea to be so sure, you know, that there is no other way. Uh, because this one, for instance, was a very uh, fast idea, if you ask me. But it didn't come out of the blue because we have already been working with this site before, so we knew it very well. And we were at a position where you could make a fast decision. But if you start from the beginning, if you ask me, we prefer, you know, shorter uh, decision making processes. Like it's like you don't want to try 70 things. Uh, but we, we, yeah, it's, even if, even if we, we have one idea and we work on it and we uh, take it forward, then it evolves naturally because you, you, you start adding layers of, you know, um, either legislation or urban codes or the client wants something else along the way because the, then they, they, they want to have a guitar collection somewhere and they didn't know it before, you know, this, these things happen. And, but they add complexity to, to the equation and, the, and the, the, you know, they make projects more real. It's not just like a, like a model. So these layers of, of reality make the project evolve. So even if it was a clear, you know, clean shot from the beginning, the end result would have been a bit different always. But yeah, I mean, it's this kind of, you try this, let's try some other things, and then sometimes you come back to the first one. It's not always like that. I wouldn't say we have a method. Okay, thank you. There is one last question. Hi, thank you for your lecture. I was wondering about the scale of your models being consequently one to 20, I believe. Is that something you deliberately chose on? And if projects grow larger in the future, would you choose for still the same scale? And how in your office physically um, are these models also parallel displayed next to each other in order to gain understanding on the same skill between projects, for example? Well, uh, this is something we are dealing with now. Uh, before summer, we threw 50% of the models we had because we simply need, needed space. Because, you know, at some point, <laughs> you can't even walk in the office. And uh, so many, many projects after, you know, taking photographs were thrown to the um, uh, waste uh, bin. But now we are starting to work on a bit larger scale projects that, you know, are no longer reasonable in one to 20. So uh, yes, we are doing those models a bit smaller, one to 50, or maybe we do a portion in one to 20 because maybe some projects, you know, sometimes parts are repetitive. So you build one of those parts in one to 20. Also, we, you know, to try materials and everything, but not the full thing, you know. If, I mean, if we, if we had to do an airport, you know, you cannot do a 1 to 20 scale model of the airport unless you have a huge office, which, I mean, it's, it's not the case. But, yeah, we are dealing with that because, in a way, we are so used to, you know, the proportions and, and uh, looking at the model and really, really, you know, really fast, you, you, you know what's wrong and what's uh, right. And if we change the scale, this will not be that you know, obvious. Because the smaller you go, 
uh, one millimeter, you know, means nothing in one to 20, but in, you know, it can mislead, it can, smaller scale models can take you to a less real interpretation, if you, if you get what I mean. But yeah, it's that versus the reality of the physical space things take. And we are currently struggling with that. Yeah. Hi, yeah. So we ourselves are students working with also relatively larger scale models. And I noticed that you uh, spoke about the fact that you want to cut through them and you want to probably explore a little bit more. But at the same time, it's a scale that's relatively um, almost resistant to uh, changes. And I want to ask you if you ever found yourself in a position to be resistant to de design changes uh, while working with models of such larger scale. But sorry, do you mean like physically resistant or conceptually? Like conceptually resistant, yes. Well, I mean, it's, I think you have to control how things grow inside you and how fixed they become. Because sometimes you, fell, you, 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 know, you fall in love with, with things and if those things are physical even more, because it's, if it's just you know a 3D file in a hard drive, you don't cherish that file that much. But if it's a built thing, with nice looking, nice proportions, it's like you know this something uh, that adds value to to that. But I think we are beyond that. We don't care. We break things. We make them over again. We break them again. Yeah. I mean, we've 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 gone past that point. Thank you. 